You're listening to a podcast from digitaloilandgas.com. This podcast is entitled, How Might Team Trump Impact the Canadian Oil and Gas Industry? The media doesn't take Trump that seriously, but does take him very literally, whereas his followers take him very seriously, but rarely that literally. This begs the question, which of the new Trump administration's energy policies should Canada take seriously? Which ones literally, and how should we all anticipate this new administration? This is more of a challenge than we should uh, than it should be, because his policy positions have not been stated with much clarity to begin with, and they have changed throughout the course of the election. So this podcast actually will be less about digital and more about oil and gas market developments, but stay with it. It's still pretty interesting. Let's begin with climate policy. While Obama has followed broadly a green agenda, Trump's position is less clear. In his Twitter feed, the president-elect has stated that climate change is a hoax perpetrated by the Chinese for some unexplained reason. And despite China's assertion that the original climate change agenda was in fact launched by the first Bush administration, who was a Republican by the way, Trump has vowed to roll back many of the policy choices of the past eight years that are aimed at climate remediation and to dismantle or overhaul the EPA. Targets include the EPA rules related to methane emissions and CO2 regulation, U.S. commitments to the Paris Climate Accord, the Clean Power Plan, which requires coal power plants to reduce emissions, anti-coal mining rules, and standards for automotive fuel consumption, and so on. I expect that the U.S. coal mining industry will see its regulatory burden reduced, which translates into some cost relief, and that will help coal producers recover from recent price pressures. Increased coal production could translate into more coal-fired power generation in the domestic market, which may put some pressure on domestic gas markets. But with new U.S. LNG export infrastructure coming online, U.S. gas will likely find alternative markets outside the continental United States. Coal-fired power plants may still convert to gas power generation or renewables for economic reasons, or because of the age of the coal plants, or from ongoing pressure from shareholders in capital markets. I don't know if you've noticed, but the big green bananas have stepped up their funding appeals. Greenpeace, Sierra Club, and the Environmental Defense Fund are all reported to have had a boost in contributions to oppose the Republican agenda. One is calling on the outgoing administration to quickly sign into law any outstanding climate-based regulations. With a Republican-controlled House, Senate, and Presidency, the environmental lobby, whose head offices are largely located in elitist liberal locations like San Francisco and Washington, are going to get a rough ride in Washington. This will help accelerate infrastructure approvals, which will give lift to the U.S. midstream sector and continued development of U.S. shale resources. Now, what about Trump and energy development? Well, in speeches, the president-elect has voiced deep opposition to continued U.S. reliance on imported oil from nations hostile to the U.S. or who are benefiting from U.S. military support without commensurate compensation. While the U.S. government does not directly control crude oil imports, it can set trade policies that can make sourcing from some nations more difficult through sanctions, although it would be very challenging to ban crude imports entirely because of how the market is unstructured. U.S. coastal refineries purchase tidal crude, for example. So who would oppose interference in crude markets? Well, certainly the large integrated oil companies who prefer freer oil markets. They benefit from crude sourcing flexibility. Perhaps the U.S. independent producers who are largely domestic and are prone to accusing OPEC of dumping oil to manipulate price. Independents would benefit from a reduction in competition from international sources, particularly the low-cost, high-quality Middle Eastern suppliers, because it could help boost prices. The incoming administration has also maintained throughout the campaign that it favors less regulation over energy markets. Subsidies on renewables interfere with markets and distort investments. They could be removed, and the market would then determine whether renewables are truly cost-competitive without pricing support, which is a good question. The stock market certainly thinks that deregulation of coal is coming. Stock prices for benchmark U.S. coal producers move sharply higher as a result of the election. Restrictions on land access for oil and gas exploration, particularly on U.S. federal lands, are also likely to be lifted, which may open up new supply sources. Now, although U.S. oil and gas companies have become more efficient because of low energy prices, it's not clear that new energy development projects would be economic considering today's commodity prices. Therefore, brownfield developments and infield projects will likely to be favored. And what about energy-related trade? 
Well, on trade, the new administration's campaign position has been very pro-energy development, and by extension, pro-energy trade. Trump wants better trading terms, reflecting his worldview that the nation is saddled with too many poorly structured uh, trade deals. The incoming administration has signaled that it would repeal or renegotiate NAFTA and approve the Keystone Pipeline project, but with different commercial considerations. Republican control of FERC, who recently blocked an LNG application, could result in more U.S. LNG projects getting to market. In other announcements, however, the president-elect has declared some nations as unfair traders and threatens retaliatory actions. He's accused China of being a currency manipulator to keep U.S. manufacturing uncompetitive, for instance. He has accused some Middle Eastern nations, particularly Saudi Arabia, of artificially inflating oil prices, while the U.S. government has, from time to time, entertained accusations that OPEC dumps oil. It's unclear how the new administration might view oil and gas imports from Canada, which routinely trade at a considerable discount to U.S. domestic prices, and are therefore susceptible to dumping claims. During the election, the president-elect proposed creation of an America desk in the Department of Commerce, whose role would be to protect the interests of American workers and companies in the U.S. This proposal is aimed at providing a mechanism for U.S. industry to challenge imports on fairness principles. It's not clear that this measure would be aimed at the oil and gas industry in the first instance, but would still provide a threat to cross-border trade. In the main, domestic energy development and trade in energy projects are good for jobs and the economy, and reduce U.S. dependence on foreign suppliers. They help sustain the Republican narrative that the U.S. can step back from its financially draining role in funding wars that are ostensibly about oil market security it no longer needs. Now, what about timing? Well, there's several thousand Republican appointees in a dozen key agencies that will be instrumental in affecting the Trump agenda. These include leaders at the Department of State for cross-border energy trade, the Bureau of Land Management for land access, particularly federal lands currently off-limits for exploration and production, the Department of the Interior for resource development, the EPA for regulations of emissions, water use, and ozone, FERC for infrastructure approvals, the Department of Energy for investment planning, and the Supreme Court for adjudicating in a more conservative fashion. The incoming administration has only a short period of time to get its transition team and plans in place and to start assigning key leaders and administrators to the 4,000-plus appointed positions across government. It is through these many appointed positions and the dozens of small, unreported, and routine decisions they execute that the Republican agenda will be carried out. Meanwhile, the outgoing administration may be unwilling to make routine decisions. This will slow down any approvals, permitting, and hearings for at least the next few months. So what does all this mean for the Canadian oil and gas sector, its producers, and its key suppliers? Well, first, oil sands are likely to benefit. Many of the operators are U.S. oil companies who will want to see open crude markets and will press the administration on this point. A Republican desire to reduce dependence on imported crude oil could signal more domestic production, a tall order, 7 million barrels per day, or a reliance on a stable, continental, and friendly source, i.e. oil sands. Second, transport services, and in particular the cross-border pipelines, will face a more receptive pro-business federal administration, although state-level governments may still oppose pipeline developments under pressure from lobby groups. Additional market access will support further oil sands growth and Canada's conventional supplies, but new pipeline projects may be a few years away from, from construction and current market pricing may make additional pipelines uneconomic. Third, there is some upside in the U.S. midstream, perhaps for Canadian investments. The pro-development, pro-infrastructure stance of the new administration could put in place federal policies that promote development, such as favorable tax rules. This may create continental opportunities for growth and expansion that may outpace the Canadian opportunity set. And fourth, Canadian LNG investments, particularly those that compete directly with U.S. projects for capital in the same portfolio, will likely face an uphill battle to get to sanction. Fifth, Canadian services are likely to benefit if the administration follows through to enable more exploration and development, although current prices may make new greenfield developments less likely. New trade rules, the America desk, may make it imperative to have a permanent presence in the United States. And finally, the renewable sector may see policy and tax changes that make existing investments less economic and new investments harder to sanction. 
Canadian renewable operators with U.S.-centric growth plans face new uncertainty and risks. So what now? Well, I'd play a wait-and-see game. Until the Republican appointees are in place, it's hard to get a clear read on the future. Meanwhile, these are my views only. Treat them as you would anything you find on the internet. You have been listening to a podcast from digitaloilgas.com. If you like what you've heard, please subscribe to future installments and visit us at digitaloilgas.com.